Welcome to Literary Insights. This is the summary of the book The Everything Store, Jeff Bezos and the Age of Amazon Brad Stone. If you like this content, please consider subscribing and liking this video. Jeff Bezos was fascinated with the exponential growth of the Internet in the early 1990s and saw an opportunity for online retail. After considering various products, he settled on books as the best category to launch with because of their vast selection and commodified nature. Bezos left his high-paying job at D.E. Shaw to start the company, despite warnings from his boss David Shaw about the risks. Bezos used a regret minimization framework and didn't want to miss the opportunity. Bezos' parents were shocked he left Wall Street but supported his decision. Bezos began planning the new company with Shell Caffin and Jeff Holden, programmers interested in the possibilities of the Internet. Bezos and his wife Mackenzie drove cross-country to Seattle to set up the new company, originally named Cadabra. Bezos made early revenue projections in a spreadsheet, though the numbers proved inaccurate. They renamed the company Amazon after a lawyer pointed out Cadabra sounded like Cadaver. Seattle was chosen for its large tech talent pool and lack of state income tax. Local businessman Nick Hanauer convinced Bezos to consider Seattle and invested in the company. Shell Caffin helped build Amazon's first website and was excited by its potential to achieve the whole Earth Catalog's vision, though initially skeptical of its success. At first, Amazon operated out of Bezos' garage. Bezos and Caffin built desks out of wooden doors and sawed legs. The company culture was casual but intense, focused on books and customers. Amazon started with little capital but got an early publicity boost and validation through mentioning by Netscape and Yahoo. The company's vision was an online bookstore with universal access and all titles and print available. Amazon struggled to raise capital from venture firms who didn't believe an online bookstore could be a $50 million a year business. Early investors included family, friends, and angel investors who believed in the vision. Amazon grew quickly and went public on May 15, 1997, raising $54 million in its IPO. The stock price increased 55% on the first day, giving the company resources to make costly investments in technology, marketing, and expansion into other product areas. Does this summary effectively capture the key highlights around Amazon's early days and origins? Let me know if you would like me to clarify or expand the summary further. Here is a summary of the key events in Amazon's early history. Jeff Bezos founded Amazon in 1994. He, Shell Caffin, and Paul Davis worked out of Bezos' garage to build a beta website. They launched the full site in 1995, offering 1 million book titles and up to 40% discounts. At first, Amazon didn't hold inventory. They ordered books from distributors after customers placed orders. Deliveries took weeks. To meet distributors' minimums, they ordered obscure books they knew were out of stock. The site got orders for many books, showing the potential of the long tail. The staff packed and shipped orders to keep up. Nicholas Lovejoy suggested holding inventory to pack more efficiently. Bezos agreed. They moved into a bigger space. In 1995, Bezos left his job to focus on Amazon. Netscape's IPO brought attention to the Internet. Bezos pitched $6 million valuations to investors despite losses. Some, like Dylan Slash Gelfond, invested. Lovejoy pleaded to join full-time. Bezos agreed after advocacy from others. Bezos wanted the best staff. His standards and low pay made it hard to hire. Staff thought his ambitions unrealistic. In 1996, growth required moves to bigger spaces. Paul Davis left. Bezos had him smash a computer. A Wall Street Journal article doubled traffic slash orders. New funding added staff slash teams. Kleiner Perkins invested $8 million, valuing Amazon at $60 million. Bezos chose them for reputation and got John Doerr on the board. Doerr's support and the bubble made Bezos aim higher. Bezos preached it big fast. Rapid growth required long hours. Christopher Smith forgot his car for eight months. 
They moved into bigger spaces, though the office was in a seedy area. They focused on customizing the site. Bookmatch failed, similarities succeeded, increasing sales. Bezos saw personalization as an advantage. Shell Caffin enjoyed helping build Amazon but worried Bezos might replace him. Bezos assured his job was secure. In 1997, new executives like Mark Breyers joined. At Breyers, they played broomball, showing competitiveness. Breyer lasted a year. Bezos wanted to constantly reinvent marketing. Bezos recruited executives to take Amazon public, including from Microsoft and Barnes and Noble. Key hires, CFO Joy Covey, retail head David Risher. They planned an IPO to raise Amazon's profile and compete with Barnes and Noble. Barnes and Noble's CEO saw Amazon as a threat. He offered to acquire Slash Partner, but Bezos Slash Albert declined, believing Amazon would win as a disruptor. So Barnes and Noble started a competing website. Amazon chose Deutsche Bank Slash Quattroni to lead their IPO. Bezos Slash Covey pitched investors on the model, like negative operating cycle and high ROI from low costs Slash infrastructure. The IPO in May 1997 raised $54 million. Regulations kept Bezos silent for weeks. Barnes and Noble sued, then launched a competing site, but struggled. In August, ex-Walmart exec Rick Dalzell joined as CIO after recruiting by Bezos slash Covey. He brought management slash engineering experience. Project Fargo aimed to stock one of every product ever made but lacked support and faded away. Bezos's ambitious ideas sometimes lacked practicality. Bezos became obsessed with fast delivery and same-day shipping. Amazon invested in Cosimo.com, a same-day delivery startup, but the idea failed. Bezos also suggested using college students for delivery, but employees pushed back. Amazon acquired Genly, a price comparison site, for $170 million in 1998. Bezos wanted Junlee's product listings on Amazon, but executives disliked sending customers away. Junlee was a failure, though the deal allowed an investment in Google. After the failures of Junlee and same-day delivery dreams, Amazon took a methodical approach to new areas. It moved into toys and electronics in 1999. Toys were hard due to short life cycles and unpredictability. Amazon convinced toy makers to sell through them. Bezos wanted to invest $120 million in toy inventory, but was convinced to start smaller. Electronics benefited from standardization, but required expertise. Amazon hired a team from a defunct retailer and built relationships with suppliers. Electronics became very successful. Toys and electronics showed Bezos's vision, but also the need to balance ambition and practicality. His push for radical ideas clashed with methodical expansion into new areas based on what customers wanted. But the mix of vision and pragmatism fueled Amazon's success. Bezos sought not just to sell products online, but to use technology and customer data to transform retail. His vision and risk tolerance were instrumental, but not all of his ideas translated into practical success. Employees had to curb some of his more radical notions. Still, under Bezos's leadership, Amazon emerged as a leading force in the dot-com boom. That covers the key highlights around Amazon's expansion into new product areas in the late 1990s, Jeff Bezos's ambitious vision, the need to balance vision and practicality, and how employees helped guide Bezos's thinking into more realistic directions at times. Amazon faced major challenges in 2000 due to the dot-com crash, losses exceeding $1 billion per year, and criticism from analysts like Ravi Surya. To survive, CEO Jeff Bezos focused on cutting costs and becoming profitable. He also aimed to turn Amazon into a platform for other retailers to sell on. Early attempts at partnerships failed. However, Toys R Us approached Amazon after struggling to fulfill orders in 1999. Amazon had expertise in logistics but lacked product selection. Toys R Us had products but struggled with fulfillment. Negotiations were difficult. Bezos wanted a huge toy selection. Toys R Us wanted control and profits. 
A deal was reached. Toys R Us would provide products, set prices, and earn most profits. Amazon would handle the website, fulfillment, and customer service for a fee and share of revenue. The partnership was a success and saved the 1999 holiday season. Toys R Us increased sales without additional costs. Customers had a better experience. The deal showed Amazon's platform model could work and appeased investors by association with a major brand. Although the companies renewed the deal for 2001, Toys R Us acquired eToys and didn't need Amazon anymore. The partnership dissolved but demonstrated the viability of Amazon Marketplace, which launched in 2000 for other merchants. Marketplace made Amazon a platform and source of profits, fulfilling Bezos's vision. The Toys R Us deal was a turning point, helping Amazon weather harsh criticism, cut losses, and pioneer its platform model. Although temporary, the partnership proved that model and showed Amazon's value to other retailers. After Toys R Us left, Amazon built upon that success with Marketplace, a key step toward becoming the everything store. In 2000, Amazon launched Marketplace, allowing third-party sellers to sell used books. This upset many inside Amazon, but Bezos believed it would benefit customers. In 2001, analyst Ravi Surya questioned Amazon's capital. Amazon aggressively pushed back, pressuring Surya and his firm. Surya left his firm a few months later. The same year, Amazon went through layoffs, closures, and slowing growth. However, after meeting Costco's CEO, Bezos reaffirmed Amazon's low-price strategy. Bezos adopted an everyday low-price strategy in 2001 to match competitors. He conceived the flywheel strategy, low prices, more customers, greater efficiency, lower prices. On September 11th, Bezos was stranded in Minnesota. Although Amazon ran TV ads, Bezos cut them as losses mounted. Tests showed ads didn't boost sales much. Bezos focused on long-term. Many executives left due to pay, work conditions, and doubts. Bezos met with them but wasn't sentimental. New CFO Tom Skutek replaced Warren Jensen, who opposed free shipping and raising prices. Conflicts arose between teams recommending products and using data. The data team took over, causing tensions. Bezos's biological father was Ted Jorgensen, a circus performer. Bezos was adopted by his mother Jackie's second husband, Mike Bezos. Teachers and families saw Bezos's gifts and drive early. His adopted status may have spurred his ambition and need to prove himself. Bezos has credited Jackie and Mike, but sees overcoming doubters as a victory over past struggles. His fascination with space and competitiveness traced to his childhood. The pieces were in place early for his success and vision. Ted Jorgensen and Jacqueline Guys married at 16 when she got pregnant. They divorced after a year. Jacqueline raised Bezos. As a child, Jeff Bezos showed signs of giftedness, curiosity, and determination. His adoptive parents and grandparents nurtured his talents. His mother recognized his focus and willfulness. In high school, Bezos was competitive and ambitious. He worked various jobs and gave a valedictory speech about space travel. Friends said he aimed to become wealthy to achieve big goals. In 2000, Bezos secretly founded Blue Origin to provide space travel and pursue his lifelong interest in space. Progress was slow but steady. Bezos viewed space travel as humanity's long-term destiny. As Amazon grew quickly, chaos and operational troubles emerged. Jeff Wilkie, a young executive, helped fix the problems. He overhauled the logistics network, applying efficiency principles he learned elsewhere. Wilkie instituted data-driven management and raised the importance of fulfillment center managers. He inspired loyalty through high standards and vision. Under him, Amazon's first automated fulfillment center opened. He was crucial to Amazon's success. Bezos wanted decentralized teams that solved problems independently with little communication. His two-pizza team concept didn't fully work but shaped Amazon's development of independent groups and flat hierarchy.
In 2000, software issues and inventory troubles led Wilkie to erupt in anger and shut down a fulfillment center, showing a leadership style like Bezos's. Bezos believed too much communication showed dysfunction. After the dot-com crash, Bezos cut costs and middle management, wanting doers who directly improved the company through independent decision-making. In summary, Jeff Bezos showed determination and vision from an early age. Key executives like Jeff Wilkie helped realize Bezos's philosophy of decentralized, independent teams and steady progress toward ambitious goals. This approach shaped how Amazon developed into a massively successful company. In 2005, Amazon celebrated its 10th anniversary with a gala in Seattle. Though successful, Amazon was overshadowed by Google at the time. In 2006, Jeff Wilkie took over North American retail. He hired Mark Onetto from GE to improve logistics. Onetto upgraded software and processes, but high turnover made organization difficult. Unions tried and failed to organize fearful, temporary workers. Amazon faced harsh criticism for extreme heat in warehouses that caused 15 workers' issues in 2011. Amazon added AC and improved conditions in response. Other challenges included fires, accidents, theft. An employee created a secret den in a warehouse, furnishing it with stolen goods. He left when found without protest. Despite challenges, Amazon improved through technology and efficiency. They saw themselves as a tech company enabling e-commerce, not just a retailer. Bezos and Wilkie battled ups and downs of building the business. Prime continued growing though initially unprofitable. It increased sales volumes, lowering costs. Bezos closely tracked signups, believing in its potential. Executives worried about losses, but Bezos thought it would win. Selecting Prime's $79 fee was hard. They considered $49 and $99, but Bezos wanted high enough to matter but low enough to try. The goal was changing shopping habits, not money. Launching Prime took faith with little data on impact. Financial analyses called it completely crazy, but Bezos relied on instinct and experience. Prime turned customers into devoted shoppers loving two-day shipping. Bezos instructed timing announcements with rival Blue Niles reports for competitive edge, but jewelry didn't grow as envisioned. Logistics Network rewrite cut costs and delivery times, giving competitive edge over eBay. In 2004, an engineer proposed a premium shipping club. Bezos loved it and made it a top priority. They considered Super Saver Platinum, but Bezos wanted a name not implying saving, so they chose Prime. Bezos obsessed over jewelry box design. They did promotions with Paris Hilton, custom ring tools, and a diamond search feature aiming to make Amazon iconic for jewelry like Tiffany's. Initially, two-thirds of jewelry sold through Marketplace to learn the business. Bezos said no traditional retail markups. Customers might buy a $1,200 bracelet and find it's $2,000. Though hiring retail executives, Bezos said now unbound from old rules. Amazon built a massive distribution infrastructure to enable its e-commerce business. Key elements include Huge fulfillment centers with advanced automation and robotics to store and ship products. Amazon has over 175 fulfillment centers worldwide. A fleet of cargo planes, trucks, and delivery vehicles to transport products. Amazon has leased 40 planes and has plans to expand its air cargo fleet. Sophisticated logistics software and algorithms to optimize delivery routing and ensure fast shipping. Amazon's logistics systems are a key competitive advantage. Partnerships with shipping carriers like UPS, FedEx, and USPS to handle parcel delivery. However, Amazon is increasingly handling more of its own shipping and delivery. Physical retail stores, including Whole Foods stores, Amazon Go stores, Amazon 4 Star stores, and Amazon bookstores. Physical stores provide places for customers to browse, buy, and return or exchange items. A device ecosystem including Echo speakers, Fire TV, Kindle e-readers, and Ring security cameras. 
These devices generate data and lock in customers to Amazon's platform. Web services like Marketplace, Payments, and Fulfillment by Amazon, which independent sellers can leverage. Amazon's distribution infrastructure supports not just first party retail, but also third party sellers. Autonomous technology, including drones, self driving robots, and automated humanoid robots. While still largely experimental, autonomous technology could significantly reduce costs and improve efficiency in Amazon's distribution network over time. In summary, Amazon has built a global distribution network and technology system that consists of physical and digital elements which work together to enable fast, low-cost delivery on a massive scale. This network is a key source of competitive advantage for Amazon and supports its position as the dominant e-commerce platform. Mechanical Turk and Amazon's initial web services demonstrated Bezos' willingness to experiment and think long-term. Though unprofitable, Bezos thought Amazon's cost structure gave it an advantage in low-margin businesses. Nuvo Media created the Rocket eBook, an early e-reader, in 1997. Though promising, a mix of being ahead of its time and strategic errors led the company to shut down. Had Amazon invested, the e-reader market might have developed sooner. Still, the Rocket eBook showed the potential of e-readers. Concerned about Apple, Amazon started Lab 126 in 2004 to develop an e-reader. After mistakes, they released the Kindle in 2007. Bezos asked the Nouveau Media founder if they had gotten it right. Bezos was determined for Amazon to dominate ebooks like Apple did music. He said, cannibalize yourself before someone else does. Despite objections, he insisted Amazon make the Kindle to control the experience. Lab 126 concluded the e-reader market was open. Bezos wanted a simple, connected device. Execs thought connectivity was insane but went along. Key decisions were a low-powered black and white display and seamless cellular access. E-Ink, used in the Kindle, was too primitive and expensive for Nouveau Media. Unlike LCD, it worked in sunlight, used little battery, and was easy on the eyes. Amazon was lucky it matured. Pentagram spent two years on the Kindle design, studying reading. Bezos added a keyboard and wireless. There were delays due to issues with the ink, a microprocessor buyout, and a wireless lawsuit. Rumors spread despite secrecy. For success, Amazon needed 100,000 ebooks at launch, pressuring publishers who had only 20,000 digital books. The relationship grew complicated. Originally symbiotic, the Amazon publisher relationship deteriorated in the early 2000s as Amazon pursued higher profits. Amazon demanded better terms and used coercive tactics, especially on vulnerable publishers. Publishers felt threatened by Amazon's power. The once amicable relationship deteriorated. Amazon learned hardball tactics from Walmart, using them on publishers and suppliers as it grew more powerful. Dan Rose and Jeff Steele targeted publishers. Here is a summary of the key points. Amazon acquired Zappos in 2009 for $900 million. The deal gave Amazon advantages in shoes and apparel and provided financial relief for Zappos amid the recession. It showed how Amazon could acquire weakened competitors during economic downturns. The recession devastated retailers like Circuit City and Borders but helped Amazon gain power. Circuit City went bankrupt while Borders failed to adapt to ebooks and the Kindle. Target and Walmart had to cut costs, but began viewing e-commerce as critical, seeing Amazon as a threat. Amazon released the Kindle 2 in 2009, gaining 90% of the e-book market. This gave Amazon immense influence over publishers through its $9.99 e-book price, which cut into hardcover sales. Publishers feared Amazon's growing control of the book industry. Zappos struggled to compete with Amazon's superior resources and technology. Though renowned for customer service, Zappos couldn't keep up with Amazon in hiring engineers or salaries. Zappos growth stalled, and its investors considered selling to Amazon. Amazon launched Endless.com to compete with Zappos in shoes but made little headway. 
However, endless promotions and discounts cut into Zappos' profits, adding to its difficulties. Zappos faced debt and inventory issues, and its growth slowed. Moritz wanted Zappos to become an independent clothing retailer, but realized Zappos couldn't overcome Amazon's advantages. The recession made the challenges of competing with Amazon clear and led Zappos to sell to Amazon. The summaries show how the recession allowed Amazon to gain power over competitors and partners, even as it accelerated broader changes in retail that would threaten many major retailers. Amazon emerged in a far stronger position, while most traditional retailers were weakened. That covers the key highlights and themes around how the recession strengthened Amazon's position relative to competitors and gave it more influence over partners, as shown through the Zappos acquisition and impact on publishers and retailers. Let me know if you would like me to explain anything in the summary further. Wusthof, a high-end German knife maker, stopped selling on Amazon twice due to Amazon violating its minimum advertised price policy. Amazon discounted Wusthof's products too steeply, undercutting its profits and competing retailers. Wusthof wanted to protect small retailers that built its brand. These retailers couldn't match Amazon's discounts. Wusthof started selling on Amazon again in 2009 after Amazon promised to follow its map, but Amazon soon violated it again. In 2011, Wusthof ended its relationship with Amazon for the second time. Wusthof felt Amazon enabled unauthorized third-party sellers to improperly discount its products. Amazon argued it had to match the lowest prices to compete. Some companies have a destructive relationship with Amazon. They get addicted to strong sales, but Amazon guts their profits and undercuts them on price. Many leave, but some return to Amazon's huge customer base. Amazon's goal is providing the lowest prices. It sees maps as inefficient. It uses algorithms to quickly match lower prices. Some big brands like Dyson and Apple avoid selling certain products on Amazon or restrict retailers. Wusthof felt trapped by Amazon's power over e-commerce. Many brands and manufacturers feel they have no choice but to sell on Amazon, even if it damages their business. Amazon's huge size and control of online retail makes it hard for companies to remain independent of them. The summary outlines Wusthof's difficult relationship with Amazon and its attempts to balance the benefits of Amazon's platform with the damage from Amazon's discounting. It also touches on the broader predicament facing many brands that rely on Amazon despite the threat it poses to their pricing power and profits. Here's a summary of the key points about ducks on Amazon. Amazon employs aggressive tactics to gain advantages over competitors and suppliers. They threaten companies to get lower prices and better terms that benefit Amazon. Amazon closely monitors the sales of products in its marketplace and will often start selling top-selling items itself to undercut third-party sellers. This creates tension with sellers in the marketplace. However, the marketplace also generates significant profits for Amazon through commissions on each sale. So Amazon relies on a mix of first-party and third-party sales. Jeff Bezos is obsessed with customers and providing the best experience. He will drop everything to address even a single customer complaint and fix issues. But he also encourages a confrontational culture where arguments and dissent are common. The culture at Amazon is intense, metrics-driven, and frugal. Salaries are average, but stock grants aim to retain employees. Perks are minimal. The company cuts costs aggressively and passes on savings to customers through lower prices. Jeff Bezos and other executives closely review each department's strategic plans and key metrics each year. Bezos focuses intently on new, fast-growing parts of the business like streaming video, AWS, and Kindle. Progress is expected rapidly. Although Bezos doesn't attend most weekly meetings, his thinking, priorities, and long-term vision shape how Amazon operates. Executives model Bezos' behavior and way of thinking. The company aims to scale how Bezos thinks and innovates. Bezos believes in long-term thinking, a willingness to fail and be misunderstood, and continual improvement of any process. 
Like Steve Jobs, Bezos has gradually convinced people to adopt his perspectives and approach business in new ways focused on the long term. Anecdotes show how Bezos will focus intensely on an issue, demand fast progress and solutions, and harshly criticize efforts that don't meet his standards. But his long-term vision and philosophy also guide how Amazon evolves. Does this summary cover the key highlights from the book on ducks? Let me know if you would like me to clarify or expand on any part of the summary. Jeff Bezos and Amazon have a long-term mindset and make steady progress toward huge goals. Bezos articulates Amazon's simple vision and goals clearly so others can contribute. Amazon started using just Amazon instead of Amazon.com in 2012 to reflect its expansion beyond e-commerce. Though constantly changing, some things like Bezos' modest routine stay the same. Bezos' life has become complicated, including multiple homes, family time, Amazon, Blue Origin, philanthropy, and the Washington Post. Occasionally, his past catches up to him, as when he emailed his biological father in 2013 with no ill will. Amazon's future likely includes faster delivery, more infrastructure, fresh-slash-device expansion, new countries, 3D printing, and antitrust scrutiny. Bezos' vision is selling everything, everywhere, conveniently. Growth into new areas like perishables, devices, and manufacturing pursues scale and efficiency. Overall, Bezos is a long-term, customer-focused thinker who built a massive, ever-expanding Amazon. Amazon dominates books slash electronics, while rivals struggled. It navigates regulations and antitrust unlike Microsoft in the 1990s. Bezos focuses on growth and invention. His everything company vision means all goods slash services. Bezos values major innovations and small improvements. Many small advantages create a strong position. Since founding, Amazon was ambitious and made bold bets for Bezos' vision but avoided threatening growth or legal issues. Continued expansion into new areas and gaining advantages over competitors is likely. Under Bezos, Amazon will pursue his vision aggressively but carefully. Amazon has dominated, avoided missteps of other tech giants, and will keep growing under Bezos. Relentless pursuit of Bezos' vision and incremental innovations have fueled success. Bezos and Amazon incorporated principles of lean operations, metrics, core values, small teams, and acting on technology to avoid disruption. Key values and philosophies from various books were built into Amazon's culture. FOIA requests are hard to fulfill for large companies. Amazon considers itself a tech company that transformed retail with technology and innovation. Apple's threat to kill Kindle was incredibly stupid. Amazon pressured publishers for lower ebook prices, upsetting others. Bezos believes in high velocity decisions, though sometimes expedient ones upset partners. Bezos instilled 14 leadership principles emphasizing customers, innovation, and long term thinking. Common author writes, Copyright, final approval, advance, royalties, subsidiary rights, reversion of rights, creative control, non-compete clause, and option clause.